In his 1963 short film The Great Swindler, the story of a filmmaker interviewing a known thief, Jean-Luc Godard once said, cinema is the most beautiful fraud in the world. Godard and the French New Wave movement were highly influential on today's filmmakers for a great many reasons. Experimentation with form, expression of thoughts, ideas, politics, and narrative abstraction, the inception of the auteur theory. But what's always stood out to me about Godard in particular was his use of images to directly interrogate the power and meaning of images. A concern that can also be deeply felt in the filmography of American so-called provocateur Harmony Corinne. The movie is called uh, Gummo. It uh, opened today, and uh, this is the, the genius it's a, it's behind new, the film, yeah, it's Harmony Corrine. Harmony it's a Corrine. new kind of movie. I just a, want people to know that right. things need to change, That's that right. you can make um, films differently You now. represent the avant-garde. Um, I rep I'm a commercial filmmaker. Yeah. I'm a patriot. I hide in trees. All right. All right. All right. Thank <laughs> you. There you go. We'll be right back with Smash Mouth. Corinne's early work, like Gummo and his screenplay for kids, draw quite blatantly on the social realism and derelict of British filmmaker Alan Clark, highlighting the very specific, crushing nature of day-to-day -day life for the disenfranchised, a gateway to many other issues like poverty, racism, and mental illness. Gummo, however, his directorial debut about a poor Ohio town ravaged by a tornado and unable to recover physically, economically, and psychologically, revealed an even deeper interest in the shape and form of his stories. In the spontaneity of John Cassavetes, for example, both in performance and filmmaking, applying not actors, real locations, and a variety of film devices and techniques. In Claire Denis' sense of the texture of people and how easily shaped it can be by their environment. In the ways Werner Herzog explores the humor and humanity of deeply depressing subjects. And then, of course, in Godard's tendency towards existentialism and formal experimentation. In collaboration with Dogma 95 pioneer and cinematographer Anthony Dodd Mantle, he continued to expand these ideas and influences in his sophomore feature Julian Donkey Boy, where he took the opportunity to literally cast Werner Herzog as well. He and Mantle shot the film using a combination of still photography and video camcorders that have been transferred onto 16mm film and then onto 35mm film, turning the mundane realities of the schizophrenic Julian and his abusive family life into a grainy, impressionistic painting in constant motion, a blur of feeling and evolution, the images expressing a freedom the confined characters just can't. And it's here that Corinne's sensibilities come alive, his images a mesmerizing amalgamation of cinema's realist, avant-garde, and impressionistic past in an attempt to create something that feels new. However, it wasn't until his most recent feature, Spring Breakers, a candy-colored neo-noir explosion, that Corinne's fascination with images transcended into something truly extraordinary. Previously, he had subtly explored the idea of the role of pop imagery in our lives. As per the friendly ghost, the friendly ghost, the dopest ghost in town. The way we latch onto, create, recycle, worship, and communicate through iconography. There was this shootout. Uh, Dirty Harry has this bad guy cornered. I mean, he was a real, real bad guy. And Harry's standing there, he's totally full of contempt, and he says to him, We have wasted many of our bullets. Do you think there is still a bullet left in your gun? And he says to him, You know, now you've got to ask yourself a question. Do I feel lucky? And then at that moment, the bad guy lunges for his gun raises it and it just does click. Yeah. He hasn't got a bullet left and Harry blasts him away. He just blasts him into a river. He blasts him, he knocks him off the feet and blasts him away. See, that's, that's good stuff. I truly like that. 
In Spring Breakers, he foregrounds this idea into abstraction, taking the story of four young college girls whose pop culture and white upper middle class ennui motivates them along with thousands of others to embark on a pilgrimage of sex, drugs, and alcohol, and turning it into a sensorial dream. An eternal pop poem about how these particular symbols, this language of desire and freedom, of liberation, created and pursued as a means of escaping mundane realities, have been co-opted and sold back to us to maintain the violent and oppressive status quo. The film opens with a montage of a St. Petersburg beach party that Corinne films as a grotesque slow-motion assault of objectified bodies and Skrillex. It's a cinematic sunstroke overwhelmed by the energy and texture at the intersection of beer, skin, and candy-colored swimwear. Many read this sequence as a simple condemnation of the ugly and vapid activities of youth party culture, but this reading misses how the visual language and construction here defines the rest of the film. Corinne himself calls the style liquid narrative. Liquid narrative. And it's essentially using the inherent ephemeral quality of cinema to capture moments and emotions in time, fluidly overlapping, looping, and folding into each other like a Mobius strip, giving a sense of infinity. This can be seen most blatantly in the recursive sequencing and dialogue. You can't be scared of shit. You can't be scared of shit. That progresses through the narrative like it is a hazy remix of itself. Bring, bring, giving a feeling of myth and inevitability. Many critics compared it to Terrence Malick's use of nonlinear editing, where the past, present, and future seem to unfold simultaneously, but the style is actually more attributable to the modern digital impressionism of Michael Mann, Corinne himself admitting that Mann's 2006 remake of Miami Vice was the only film he watched in preparation and was directly influenced by, where the form itself is used as an abstract reflection of the way the characters are feeling. In the case of Miami Vice, the huge emotions of Sonny and Crockett practically bending time and space. As gross and shallow as it may be, Corinne and cinematographer Benoit Deby's camera is unironically swept up by the disorienting infinity that these kids feel, and understands the pursuit of it. This idea dominates the first half of the film as the four young college girls' dissatisfaction with drinking, smoking, and singing Nelly songs in their dorms in between their lectures on civil rights and reconstruction era America drives them on their journey of MTV fantasy self-actualization. The electronic lullaby soundtrack courtesy of Cliff Martinez expressing the genuine innocence of this teenage spiritual quest. That that innocent and fantasy casually sheds itself into real-world violence in an incredible tracking sequence where Nicki Minaj's moment for life plays in the background while the girls perform armed robbery. is an interesting digression the film later returns to, but the rest of the early scenes in the film are quite empathetic to millennial ennui and the pursuit of autonomy and identity within this systemically monetized culture. Spring Break may be another capitalist ritual, a false fantasy sold by movies and music videos, but to those who crave it, who convince themselves of its liberation through pop rituals and excess, in all its surreal dreamlike glory, it still looks and feels genuinely real. There's something happening there. And with matters of the inner self, sometimes that's all that matters. This is the room of the world, y'all. You can change your life. You can change who you are, y'all. You just got hypnotized and transported to another realm, y'all. And this lasts forever. This sense of innocence and fantasy maintains itself in content and form until the girls are arrested, of course, and the inherent criminal associations of their new American dream are made explicit. And it's here with the introduction of James Franco's Alien that the film truly explodes. Gangster. Alien is the fantasy personified, an inflated performance of self-made success and autonomy, a gangster with a heart of gold living an eternal life of impulse and sensation. The key word there is performance, as we begin to see this cultural fantasy unravel its superficiality, its performative outer layer, and reveal the material reality it stems from. It's also what makes James Franco, an actor who is too often self-aware of the performance he's giving, perfect for this particular role. 
The style remains, the feeling and the rhythm too, because Alien chooses to live in this fantasy too. But his reasons are material. Alien comes from a disenfranchised community. Most of his friends are people of color, and it's telling that when this is revealed is when the girls start to express discomfort. What they don't seem to understand is that this fantasy they've latched onto, this iconography they're pursuing, wasn't made for them. It's not for young white college girls to find themselves spiritually, but a means for the socially and economically deprived to find the closest thing to power, happiness, and material success the system will allow them to have. It's a grotesque replacement of the American dream, mutilated and sold back to a culture that spends so much time ingesting pop imagery. No moment in the film captures this better than the most infamous and quotable scene, MTV Cribs Alien Edition. I got shorts, every fucking color. I got designer t-shirts. I got gold bullets. Here we can see Alien literally empowered by money. Stack and change. Brands. I got escape, Calvin Klein escape. Mix that shit up with Calvin Klein B. Smell nice, I smell nice. Movies. Starface on repeat, Scarface on repeat, constant y'all. He's found a way to transcend earthly capital, or at least present an image of himself having done it. The problem is that it's just that, an image. Alien finds himself caught in a turf war with neighboring gangster and childhood friend Archie, played by Gucci Mane, because he hasn't transcended the violent dog-eat-dog -dog nature of capitalism that functions by pitting the poor against the poor. And it's here that all of the ideas of performance, iconography, pop culture, and violence all intersect in the film's most stunning sequence. Play something. That's y'all want to hear. Something sweet. Something uplifting. Something sweet and uplifting, huh? Yeah. Play something inspiring. Oh, you all want to see my sensitive side. Mm -hmm. Sure yeah. do. Play something fucking inspiring. All right. This one is by a little-known pop singer by the name of Miss Britney Spears. One of the greatest singers of all time, and an angel if there ever was one on this earth. <laughs> The girls, most of whom were cast for being pop culture icons, Lena Gomez and Vanessa Hudgens on the Disney Channel and Ashley Benson on Pretty Little Liars, have shed their symbols of inspiration and transformed themselves into images. Money, violence, and in its own way love and freedom unfolding in a harmonious dream of pop music. But ultimately that's all it is, a dream. And when the material reality, that in a matter of weeks they've gone from college students to mistresses in a gang war, comes knocking again, we get one last slow motion montage meant to directly mirror the opening St. Petersburg one. Cliff Martinez delivers his best touch, composing a loving, orchestral version of Skrillex, while the last two remaining girls literally gun down people of color and deliver dreamy voiceover of what reads like a shallow philosophical Facebook status. Everyone was just trying to find themselves. It was way more than just having a good time. We're different people now. We see things differently. More colors, more love, more understanding. God, it was so nice to get a break from reality for a little while. It's an incredibly socio-politically charged sequence, images of white faces laughing and partying directly entwined with the corpses of the disenfranchised. A visual rendering of cultural appropriation, maybe, but more importantly, an emotional sensation that captures who truly feels the consequences of an en masse culture choosing to live in a dream instead of acknowledging that maybe your dissatisfaction, maybe your isolation and lack of meaning comes from very real systems of disempowerment. And all of this returns back to Godard's preoccupation with the meaning of images. This fantasy, these pop images, they are infectiously beautiful, intoxicating even, and there's value in that, in the feelings that they give you and you give them. But there's an inherent fraudulence in the way that they've been co-opted and monetized and used to maintain oppressive systems, all under the guise of a phony, hazy dream of commercial success and liberation. Seems like a dream. Seems like a dream. Seems like a dream.
Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. Uh, for new viewers, welcome to Cinema Musings, a video essay series where we analyze and discuss films, their makers, and their formal aesthetic and thematic concerns to hopefully come to a deeper understanding of them. Uh, for old viewers who might be confused that they're subscribed to a channel they've never heard of, uh, it's still me, Josh Lewis. Still talking about movies here. But after the response to my essay that I did on why I think the Magic Mike movies actually own, which you can watch just over there, um, you know, I had a bit of a change of heart on what I want to do with this channel. I want to do less reviews and less like vloggy kind of content, and I want to make essays like this. So if you like this video, you know, definitely subscribe now. There's going to be more of this content to come. Um, and I know that this channel has went through, you know, immense changes and periods where there's been no content, but, you know, I took some time off to kind of figure out what I wanted to do, and I figured out that it was this. Uh, so welcome, welcome. We're on a new endeavor together, uh, and I'm excited to get started. Uh, and thanks so much to those of you who, after the Magic Mike video, which was posted almost a year ago now, uh, supported me on Patreon, because your guys' support is why this channel is happening right now. Um, so for those of you that, you know, like what you've seen so far and you want to see more, um, I definitely recommend going and supporting the Patreon, even if it's just a dollar whatever you can do. It frees up time for me to make videos like this and I can make more of them and maybe better versions of them. And 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 truly don't worry if you can't, if all you can do is just watch and enjoy, you know, maybe just share the video, maybe just, you know, tell your friends about it, tell your family about it, I don't really care. Um, I just wanna make this content and, you know, I've finally found something that I'm really, really interested in and really wanna pursue this. Um, and I hope you guys, you know, want to tag along with me while I do that, because, you know, I think that the goal here is to spark perspectives and discourse, and I really wanna see that, you know, just as much from you guys as it is from me. Anyway guys, I didn't plan this part of the video very well. Uh, I wasn't really intending to make this uh, a channel update at the end of another essay, but uh, you know, it was just, I thought it would be weird if I haven't posted in a long time and all of a sudden there's a new thing and the channel's been rebranded and all of this. So this was more just to say, hey, welcome to the new channel. This is the kind of content you can expect from now on. Um, support the Patreon if you, if you like it. That's all there is to say about it. Anyway guys, Thanks so much for watching, and thanks so much for the support that you've given me thus far, and probably will continue to do so into the future, no matter what endeavor I seem to be pursuing at that time. Um, but for now, this is what I'm up to. Stay tuned for the next essay.